Hello and welcome there to another episode of the Cliff Notes podcast, where we ask a leader and find a way. This week we've been, been joined by Eyal Danon, uh, who is uh, a director at Clockwork Dog uh, in the UK. Um, they m- provide technology and services for live interactive experience. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, sun's out and uh, slowly the the year is cranking on and uh, things are gears are turning. So um, I just wanted to to get into space uh, first and uh, thanks for for joining us. We had a had a good conversation the other day and I thought no, we've got to got to bring this out to to a wider audience on on the show here uh, of the the great work you're doing. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think we had too much fun talking and not enough time recording. So let's let's see if we can capture that now. Just before we get into to talking about the the sort of hardware and software and different things that you guys uh, provide, um, could you give us a little bit more of a, an understanding of uh, so that people maybe who are not so aware of what is a live interactive experience? I mean, is this something you do on your own or together or at home or where is this? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, we crafted the sentence live interactive experiences because a lot of people like to use the word immersive and uh, haven't really thought about what that means. Uh, it, it's It's essentially just that the... The idea is that it has to be live. So it's somewhere, something where people do in the real world, um, or there has to be an aspect of it that people do in the real world. So it's not something that you would do sitting at home watching TV or with a VR headset on or anything like that. And uh, it has to be interactive in that it's not sitting in a darkened theater watching a show happen. Uh, The audience or sometimes the performers or maybe even back of house staff have some way of interacting with the experience and changing that experience with their interactions so it might be that the audience gets to make a decision about what happens in the show and they get to choose how they are going to uh, interact with the show so traditional like a really obvious example of that is something like an escape room where a bunch of people walk into a physical live space and just start touching things and playing with things and pulling levers and opening doors Uh, that's a classic um, live interactive experience but then anything up to the kind of big immersive theatre shows or uh, live interactive gaming, any of that kind of stuff, LARPing, all of that sort of thing is kind of under the umbrella of live interactive. And so these are these are like sort of paid experiences, things that um, it's as though being inside your own play or in, inside your own movie, um, uh, sort of a bit like a game, a bit like an experience. Uh, I think that's what I'm getting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's generally much more narrative driven. Uh, is the kind of stuff we work on. So it's, it's yeah, being in your own story, being in your own play, being in your own game, that kind of stuff works. We, there, there is a little bit of uh, art installations and experiential marketing where people just, you know, go up to a stand in King's Cross Station and press a button and get a Mars bar. But um, ma- mainly it's the kind of big narrative driven stuff that we work on. Mm hmm. And so let's just c- connect that back across. I mean, both first for yourself, but then in, in the broader sense, what what gets that from that sort of um, that, that interactive performance space into into hardware and software? Uh, I mean, wh- how, how did you get into this space? Yeah, so I, I personally come from a, a theatre world. So I used to be a director, not very good director, uh, and I used to be a theatre technician. And uh, my two directors, one of them was a software developer still is a software developer now he just does it for us uh, and uh, the other one comes from an acting and filmmaking world so between us we just wanted to make a little narrative based experience a little escape room uh, that was based on a story and as part of making that we just discovered that the real magic happens when there is a person in a room that's interacting with something and the room responds to that person in real time and that can be something as simple as the you know press a button and a light comes on, right? That's just the light switch. But when the audio, all the lighting, all the machinery in the room, whether it's fans turning on or doors opening or motors moving, when all of that responds in real time directly to an action that a person takes, the person suspends their disbelief and really believes that the thing they're in is real. Um, So we set off on making the tech product, which is the only real way of, of getting that very low latency, immediate response. And we assumed lots of other people were doing it, but it turned out a lot of other people were looking at people, looking at customers through cameras and pushing sticks through walls, which was a great budget way of doing it. And a lot of people still do it, but the responses aren't um, immediate. They aren't, you know, 
below 20 millisecond latency kind of speeds. Um, so that's when we started building the tech product and started essentially making it available for people to be able to use so that anyone can make magical real time experiences. Gotcha. So it's almost like uh, making a, I don't know, uh, like a machine or a custom sort of uh, uh, production process. <laughs> it's the person's inside sort of pressing buttons and things. And, and that that's already working. It's already set up. It's not that you're having, like you're saying, have this sort of two way disjointed conversation between people behind the wall and people <laughs> inside inside the room um, having that experience. Yeah, absolutely. That pain point was that you were finding you yourselves um, or you were getting requests for this, the kit that you'd put together uh, for your own experiences um, into that other people wanted to license that or buy that. Um, I mean, what drove you to then start making um, sort of enclosures and networking and sensors and putting the whole lot together? I mean, it's, it's essentially what you said. Uh, people came to us, they saw our experiences, they went, oh, wow, that's really amazing. Could you put in a tech system for us? And we did it for a few people and it got quite expensive because we had to build it custom for each individual person so uh, we got a bit of a it's going to sound awful for everyone in the live events industry but we got a bit of a lucky break with covid where we had everything closed and no one was asking for tech systems for a while and that was after us delivering these systems for a couple of years and we got a chance to essentially rip apart everything that we had which was a little bit hacked together and it was just good enough for the next show which is next week um, and we got to rebuild everything so that it was much more kind of plug and play, uh, lots more kind of protections on the hardware. The software is, um, yeah, like a no code tool. Um, but that, that came out of a need from the industry for people to be able to create their own experiences and not to have to be developers or programmers or electrical engineers to be able to do that. Um, so far we've done no marketing touch wood and people keep coming because I think they, they like the product. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, what's a what's a, a core product or your core lines of product then that you're you're producing? Yeah. So on the the hardware side, we've got uh, six kind of native products, and then we've got lots and lots of different things that we can interact with. So uh, the way that our hardware works is essentially it's a uh, networked device, uh, not too far off from uh, a microcontroller or a PLC, but customized for our particular devices so and each one of those six items is made to interface with particular types of inputs or outputs so um, one of them we call the digital master and all that will do is that will do digital signals in and out so it'll be detecting the or passing on the state of a digital input to it so a button or a switch and you can plug you know 32 different buttons and switches into this and it will uh, send the state of that over the network to our software. And then the software decides what to do with it what, based on how you've programmed your show. So if you know you press this button, it sends it up over the network and the software goes, great, when you press this button, we're going to turn on that light, which then goes back down to the network to a different one of our boxes. Maybe it'll be uh, the DC master, which is able to switch on and off or fade up and down DC uh, panel so it'll turn on uh, a, a 12 volt lamp or something like that and that's that's sort of the core of the hardware is we have a whole bunch of different things that will allow you to connect all the different kinds of buttons and switches and sensors and rfid readers and servos and motors and all that kind of stuff um into the network so that it can send the state up to the network uh, up through the network to our software and then our software decides what to do with that and then it sends it back down again to another one of them. Sponsorship of this podcast has been brought to you by Holding Bay, the digital web agency. Holding Bay specializes in working with B2B companies like manufacturers to build better solutions and drive better sales funnels. So if you would like to build a web application or improve your branding and sales funnel, get in contact today holdingbay.co.uk or call us on 01273-044019. And, and I mean, appreciating that, that an order may be very bespoke and someone may be trying something like this out or they may have a, a previous experience and they're, they're, they're kitting out um, new rooms or a new space. But um, what, 
what might they come to you with? I mean, what, what is the problem space here? Is they going to go, uh, or are you going to suggest, okay, start with, with, with some, some servos and, and some master, uh, some sensors and things um, for them to start with? Um, or, or is it very much you've got to go in and look at that space and see, well, what do they want to do? Is, is this a, a lot of pressing buttons or is this a lot of things moving or sound? Or where, where do you start? Is, is there a standard way that you might start and then you build so we've we've built the product to be completely modular. So the idea is that um, you don't need to have a complete idea of what it is you're going to build when you start. And often people will come to us and go, we have a finished idea of what the room is, and here is a list of equipment that we need, and they'll buy it on our store, and, and that's it. And then a few weeks later, they'll go, ah, oh, well, we started playing with it, and we really want to add this in, and then they add another box. And then they go, well, we, we've played with it a little bit more, and it would be great if we could also do this, and they add another box. Um, it, so it doesn't it doesn't penalize you for doing it either way. Um, generally, what we have said to people is just get something like the digital master that I mentioned earlier on. And we've got a little starter set, which has got a couple of LEDs and a couple of buttons on it. And that's more for people to learn how to use uh, our system and to get a grips with kind of get to grips with how it works and how the kind of inputs over the network and then outputs back out over the network function and then from that they're able to mainly do it in software so we encourage people to not buy much hardware um, at the offset just a little bit to start off to understand the principles of it and maybe some of these people haven't put together a network before so they'll learn how to do that and then they can create most of their show and test it completely virtually so they're able to simulate channels and motors and all of that and then only when they go, great, I'm starting to install my room, do they buy the hardware and they start putting those boxes in place. And hopefully that means that people can really dream quite big. Um, we, we've made it to be a creative tool so that you don't have to do an awful lot of work in order to change what your idea was. And we find that most people in the first few weeks of being open are tweaking things and changing things based on sort of audience, uh, uh, audience reviews and all of that kind of stuff. So... You don't really have to come to it with a finished idea um, to do anything. But but these are these are finished products. I mean, they, they're not like uh, it's not like a hobby <laughs> thing that you're putting together your own sort of boxes and PCBs or rebadging other things. They're, you're you're actually um, uh, going out and, and are you making these yourself or are you distributing themselves? Where where are you where are you getting this stuff? So we we manufacture them as in we have a we work with a UK electronics company that manufactures the the boards for us. Uh, and we've only got six different products. We've got about turning around and I'm in, currently in our warehouse. I'm turning around and having a look at uh, our stocks and going finger in the air. Five, six hundred different, uh, not different boards, five, six hundred in stock uh, across those different um, six products. So it's. It's not something where people have to contact us and then we have to go and manufacture it, especially for them. Um, it, it basically works like a kind of modular plug and play system. So they go, we want a bunch of buttons. They buy the digital master and they put buttons in. If they run out, they, they just get another digital master and put that in. And they get another digital master and put that in as well. Um, so it, it is, it, it, you get the benefits of working with something like uh, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, where you can just kind of add an extra one in, add an extra one in, uh, and it doesn't add complexity to the infrastructure of the overall system. Oh, that sounds that sounds very good. Um, and in in terms of you uh, producing your own or, or working with manufacturers to produce it, is is this that you then have to work as to what sort of efficiencies and whether you can reuse um, certain enclosures or parts or uh, fixtures or power supplies or things? Absolutely. Uh, is, is those sort of whole lessons you've had to be through. Yeah, well, we're on the third, fourth it, different iteration of the hardware at the moment, um, and we're a, you know, we we'd be considered a kind of small supplier of these or small small producer of these. Uh, a few hundred boards at a time is not a is not a large amount. It's not something that you could get um, vacuum formed boxes for at a particularly cheap rate because you're paying huge amounts for tooling costs. Um, so we've had to be a bit clever with how we produce the enclosures. In fact, that's a great example because all of our six products are the same shape, the same size. Um, they all use the same tops and bottoms and sides. And apart from one of them, the same backs, and then all the only, the only panel that has to change is the front panel. 
And that way we can order at least some of the enclosures in kind of a reasonable bulk. Uh, and it means that we've got you know, spare parts across them and all of that. Um, we've also had to be clever with the material and the production. We've tried to weigh up something that we are able to put together ourselves, as well as something that looks nice, uh, something that is uh, structurally sturdy, something that is of reasonable value and something that we're able to print on. Um, and what we've ended up doing is we've used uh, black PCBs um, with no copper on them. So we've essentially gone to a PCB manufacturer and gone, can you give us black PCBs and print in this way and CNC out these ways? And we've designed a way for them all to clip together um, so that it, it all holds together quite well. Uh, and PCBs are made out of uh, FR4, which is a type of fiberglass, it's a type of very well fire rated fiberglass. So we get sort of excellent fire retardancy as well as a good structure, as well as a good finish because uh, PCBs have to be CNC cut to such exacting tolerances that you're always going to get the same finish every time. Now, that's not a great process if we're making tens of thousands of them, but if we're making them in the batches of a few hundreds, then it works really well as kind of interim for us. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you mentioned um, with, with fire retardants, and I was going to say if these are being like um, embedded into walls or behind, um, I don't know, whatever sort of display or interactive. They, they obviously, the people who are using these are not looking at these boxes. The people who set them up are, <laughs> but afterwards they should be hidden and they should be away. So did you have to work with a certain level of standards or, or, or work through that to, to make sure they passed regulations or things or no, we've we've gone through the whole uh, process of getting them uh, both UKCA and CE checked um, because we are, and, and in fact, that kind of compliance has in some ways defined the direction that we've gone uh, with some of this hardware. We haven't tried to go into uh, anything over 125 volts as an input. So we've gone our boxes can only take up to 12, 24 volts uh, and we haven't tried to put any sort of wireless technologies in there just because there is such a kind of gulf that you have to pass when you start adding um, any sort of uh, antennas into it, or in fact, batteries, if you put batteries into it, or if you're going into higher voltages, um, it's kind of an, an extra step in terms of the testing and compliance that's required um, for all of those things to, to pass. So we have, we've got all the certificates, we've got all the, um, uh, all of the tests for all those and, and they have passed them. But that kind of compliance has meant that we've we've defined our products of this. And it may be that we go into uh, another process in future where we go, right, now we're going to add whatever it may be, battery power, or now we're going to add uh, some sort of uh, radio signaling or anything like that. But that has been a big concern of ours from the beginning, because you're right, people are burying these into... Uh, into props sometimes sometimes they build them into server racks and put them in a server room and that's that's always lovely but sometimes people don't sometimes people just put them in a prop that's made out of timber that may not be fire retardant itself because we're not always installing these things in fact nowadays very rarely are we installing them we don't know the quality of the install they're going to be going into we also don't know the quality of the electronics that they're going to be connected to um, you have to provide your own power supply for these so who knows what power supplies people are using? Uh, you can buy anything off the internet. So we've put lots and lots of work into the boxes to make sure that at least our section is as safe as possible. And you were mentioned before, um, we were talking the other day on um, the changes that have had to happen with with both the pandemic and there, there had been supply problems with different countries too, um, just generally for, for, for the sort of sector. Um, I mean, have you been hit with uh, with having either chips or, or, or raw materials or whatever, uh, shortages or changes of supply? Or I mean, I think you even said you, you spent some of the, the pandemic reworking some of your parts. So, um, is that a whole still a whole thing for you for, for companies that that maybe are used to working parts for other people but maybe think well we could make a product some of this is ordered regularly um but but is that a whole other level of commitment into when you've got to stock and supply and, and keep inventory for, for your own product not something that someone else is paying for yeah I'm, i mean i don't think there's an electronics company out there that wasn't hit by some in some way um by the supply line issue we we set down the line of uh, redesigning our hardware 
March 2020, right at the beginning of lockdown uh, in the UK. Um, and at that time, there weren't supply line issues. And we thought to ourselves, this is a wonderful idea. We're going to spend all this time doing it. And then when we come out the other end, we're just going to be able to manufacture to our heart's content. And about eight months into that is when we started seeing the supply line issues. It's very likely that they other people who were much more set up than we were saw them before that. But that's that's when we discovered it. Um, so our first batch of um, boards were using components that were no longer available. So we had to instantly redesign, uh, not huge amounts, but there were a couple of um, a couple of chips that we just had to remove or we had to design it in a way where we could swap out for other kind of generic components so that if one supplier was unavailable, we could use, use it from another. Um, and at that time, we basically went, we need to stockpile. And stockpiling for us is not quite like stockpiling for uh, other very large manufacturers. We're talking about a thousand uh, chips, like uh, maybe, I think the largest amount we've ever had to stockpile is about 1,800 chips. Um, and that meant that we will know that we'll be okay for the next six months and we've got another six months to find uh, alternatives or an alternative supplier of those chips. Um, but even now, we are seeing supply line issues um, across not just uh, the chips, but also manufacturers. Um, China's been having a lot of issues and we started manufacturing out in China when they had their zero COVID policy. They were having various different phase lockdowns and factories were closing. And even if we had all the right components, we weren't able to get them manufactured. And that's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason we moved over to the UK, um, but that's one of the reasons we moved over because we, we thought to ourselves that at least as a young technology company, we'll be able to benefit from the big machine that is China. Um, but actually, that turned out to be false. Um, we were hoping to move over to the UK at some point, and we moved over much sooner than we than we thought. We moved over almost almost immediately after manufacturing. So, yeah, supply line issues have been a lot of fun uh, and continue to be uh, interesting. Well, well, well done for, for <laughs> challenge that working with with that yourselves i mean has, was it i mean did anything interesting come out of that i mean did you said you had to to rework it but do you think do you think some of it helped you or some of it it's just that natural evolution of, of sort of switching between uh different parts and, and finding better ones or better fits i think i think everything that you do even the negatives will help you in one way or another even if you even if you just take a learning from it but the fact that we were forced to very early on develop our boards in a way that we can swap out different types of chips just means that we are um, just much more able to be agile now. If one thing's not available, we can order in another one. We now don't need to do any of those redesigns. And doing that early when we, there was no demand on our hardware was wonderful. Um, if we had to do all those redesigns now when we see the stock is running out on the shelves and people are demanding... Uh, equipment and we have to then let down customers that would be a that would be a real problem um, but we had the the kind of time and the breathing space to be able to do that then um, but also there were a lot of benefits in terms of see we we were not very experienced uh, designers of technology or circuit designers uh, we were working with a few um, electrical engineers who recommended various different things and what that meant is that we could by trying out different chips because we had to at the time because we weren't able to get an infinite stock of the ones we wanted we got to see some of the benefits and some of the pitfalls of various different types of things an example is um one of the motor controllers for one of our boards um we were looking into um which motor controller exactly we'd use um and just the level of uh, error um, what's the word I'm looking for? The word, the amount of error reporting that you get on some chips is just way more than what we thought. So there are some really advanced uh, motor driver chips out there that will give you huge amounts of information about what's gone wrong with the motor you've attached it to and the power supply and all of that. Um, which you know we've we've been able to fold some of that into our product, which has been really great. Great. It's, it's, yeah, it's nice when uh, you can add innovation or not get, not get swamped though if something's giving you more than uh, more than it might. Um, and, and I mean, do you, you you feel sort of um, I guess quite 
sort of complete or the, the the product and things are stable and you're you've you've got something you're you're innovating on now um but as you said you're you're still feeling like you're sort of a, a sort of small to medium size uh business in terms of volume compared to maybe sort of bigger manufacturers but um do you think you'd have any lessons to people who were thinking or businesses that were thinking of making their own products or or how you feel your journey has gone as a, as a company um with this yeah, I think I think the one piece of advice I'd say is at, at no point assume that you're finished. Um, we we are always in a state of being a little bit uncomfortable, sort of self-inflicted uh, discomfort. Where whenever we bring out a product, we are we're lucky that we get to install a lot of our products ourselves. Uh, not always, but we got to do it in the early days, so we got to see all of the problems with them. And we got to be changing and innovating and updating and improving in real time. So I think whenever you release a product, don't assume that, well, thank goodness we got it out the door. Now we don't have to think about it anymore. Um, there are so you only really start to learn about uh, a product, an electronics product, once it's in the hounds of other people and once it's out there and being you know really used in anger. So that's the. Uh, that's the first one I'd say is, yeah, don't, don't assume it's finished at the, the day you launch it. It's, that's just the beginning of the second part of its life, uh, not the first part when you develop it. Uh, but then also don't, uh, don't rush and uh, don't, yeah, don't go too fast, don't go too slow. Um, there was a definite habit for people to not release their product until it's perfect. Um, and it which is a thing that can never occur. It'll never be perfect. Nothing is ever perfect. Um, don't sit on it for too long. Uh, but also there are certain things that you need to do before you release it. And those things are, is it functional and is it safe? Um, and if it can tick both of those boxes, then I would recommend just putting it out there in the world and seeing what people tell you about it because you, you can only see from your own perspective. And the more perspectives you get on it, um, the better you're going to learn and ultimately the better your product and your business are going to be. Um, yeah. Don't be too fast. Don't be too slow. I, I think that's, that, that's wise advice. I mean, do you, do you end up, I, I don't know how, how, how involved are you as a company in actually using uh, your hardware and software in terms of developing it? Or do you have to make sure you're closely partnering or closely listening to that feedback loop? Um, because if you've just got a product and you're waiting for other people to use it, well, maybe you're not pushing it as hard as if you were actually uh, developing these spaces for yourselves and, and you need to have them as profitable and, and, and get the most out of them. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we we are lucky that we get to use our product a lot. Um, there never a week goes by before like where I have not actually had to sit down and plug some stuff into our hardware and connect it to our software and use it. Um, and that's true for our entire team, but we use it in a slightly different way to most of the people that will be buying our software and buying our hardware. Um, we are generally installing these into the very large immersive theater shows where we've got 10 different people programming. We've got, you know, 20 different technicians walking around and all testing different hardware at the same time. And that's fun and it's great, but it's not the experience of most of our customers. Most of our customers are um, much smaller companies that are building uh, small art pieces, escape rooms, some sort of small interaction where they've only got a couple of boxes and it's just one person or it's just two people, one person who's installing, one person who's programming. So we get to test an awful lot ourselves, uh, but we still have to be connected with all of those people out there who are doing it in a different way to how we're doing it. Um, so recently we've had um, calls with a lot of our customers just going, How's the hardware treating you? What would you change? Um, what do you think of, you know, various different parts of the system and then giving them examples of improvements or giving them examples of if things changed or if they had different amounts of channels and kind of seeing how that would have affected their installations in the past or how that would affect their installations in the future. So we can, we can test it for ourselves, but again, we only see it from our perspective and we only do some types of shows, not all the types of shows that you can do with these. Mm -hmm. that sounds that sounds a good way of keeping keeping in touch and and not not resting on uh yeah we shipped now it's <laughs> someone else's job yeah um i mean what what's what's the next challenge or or the the next um piece that that you'd like to 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 push into uh for the company so we've done an awful lot of stuff in the u k um 
in terms of escape rooms that's that's really where we came from uh, immersive theater we've done loads of that now which has been great um there's a sector that we're um really interested in that isn't enormous in the uk but it's much bigger in the us which is haunts or haunted houses and haunt experiences and they're a very they're a very different type of thing um where immersive theater and escape rooms tend to have these kind of overall networked connected systems um where the thing you do at the beginning relates to the thing at the end haunted houses don't necessarily have to have that um sometimes it's just like a couple of jump scares in some areas which has absolutely no bearing on the end of the experience uh so that'll be a really interesting thing for us about whether people are no longer interested in a large network that covers your entire building that has all these things connected going back to one computer are they instead looking for little controllers that can just do this one small thing and once they're locked away in a box you never have to connect to them via a computer again or anything like that um so that's going to be an interesting one for us um it's it's sort of moving the 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 narrative is almost non-linear in the sense of it it doesn't have to go beat by beat in order but there is a sort of progression to it or there's a sort of there's an arc to it it might not go in quite the right order Um, yeah whereas these are these are almost totally non-linear they they they're sort of like disconnected almost experiences um even though the experience as a whole is going to happen but you could have got scared twice and missed something else and things and that's still the same experience almost yeah Two, two, in, yeah, in a haunted house experience, from a technology perspective, two things that are, are, are at either end of a corridor could also be in different countries entirely. It doesn't matter. The two things don't have to relate to each other. Or I think the, the question is, is that, is that the way the haunted house industry is going, where actually everything is connected to everything and you're creating a much more immersive experience? So the first scare and based on what people do and how they interact and where they go and how fast they are informs what the second thing is and then informs what the third thing is so there's a there's an innovation that we're hoping to be able to bring into it but if we are just looking to move into that industry and keep it as it is um then it's very different to how we are currently thinking about um connected systems so yeah. Now this, this, this inspired me. I, I, I used to make these sort of spaces but very badly and half of it was just stayed on paper because um, we didn't, ha- didn't have the electronics department in our, our uni. So I didn't have other people to talk to of, of making sort of caves and spaces, but um, make me think of, uh, yeah, you could have in a sense of if it was a haunted house, imagining there was a presence or a ghost or something that's in the house, mm-hmm. but it's not a person. It's, it's, it's actions that happen or things that happen that you could say, if the person moves fast through the house, we want them to have noticed that presence is there. Now they might notice it by a book falls out in one room or someone, something jumps out in another room, but we don't want that to happen in, in book, then jump in necessarily that order, because if they've run past the book and the book can never happen, then the jump can never happen. But you might have it that it needs to be subtle experiences that happen in lots of different places in the house. And you might not trigger all of them. It sort of depends time-based or presence or how fast you are through, through the space that it's going to happen then to slowly introduce that thing to you so that you don't have that thing of you've, you've rushed through somehow a couple of rooms or you weren't paying attention and then suddenly you have a big scare. And that was the, that was meant to be the crescendo. And that was the yeah. first thing you saw by mistake, just because you took a, a wrong turn or, or anything else like that. Yeah. Well, and sp- yeah. speed and direction and all that are just, just two of the variables. I mean, you can right. really go into customizing the user's experience where, you know, you have a you have a room where they see a couple of books or magazines or whatever it is on in the front corridor and whichever ones they pick up or whatever they leave through and do that. That's when in the library, those books come out at you and get thrown out. And it's all very much based on the choices that you made um, will very much define your experience. Um, you can do all sorts of cool things like that. But mm-hmm. we what we need to do is let people know that the technology is out there for them to be able to design in that way until now nobody's been designing in that way um just because it it would have cost an awful lot of money for people to do it until now um they would have had to create do all the work that we've been doing for the last few years just for one experience yeah got you got you well an exciting space i mean uh is there is there any other sort of uh, you think challenge for 
for for your customers or for yourselves or sort of um uh, world worldwide change sort of political change anything else um that you feel that that's either a challenge or you can see uh, on the horizon in the next few years is going to going to open this up or or, or you're going to have to work extra hard to get through yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that's probably concerning everyone in the entertainment industry is, uh, especially in the UK, cost of living crisis is a big problem. Uh, people have a lot less disposable income, which means they're, they're, going, they're spending less money out on uh, leisure. Uh, generally, the evidence that we got from uh, the financial crash in 2007 was that people were buying less things and still spending money on experiences. But overall, the entire leisure industry didn't do well out of that. Um, and we are rooted in the leisure industry, whether it's escape rooms or immersive theater or haunts or whatever it is. It's, it still requires people to have that disposable income to want to go out and do experiences. And although we, we think, we believe, touch wood, that we provide a better experience using our technology than looking at people through cameras and putting, you know, pushing sticks through walls, that is a cheaper option. And if people are spending less money on tickets or there are less people coming through the door, then that could be attractive to some owners. So that's our, that's kind of our big concern going forwards is, you know, based on an awful lot of things. The war in Ukraine is one of them. Um, but that in turn, uh, pushing up material prices, pushing up um, electrics prices, um just has a huge huge knock-on effect on the leisure industry on the economy in general um and i think like everyone in the entertainment and the leisure industry are a little bit concerned luckily we are not hit directly we're secondary to that because we are a service to that industry people not buying tickets doesn't directly affect us but it affects our customers which ultimately will affect us as well okay yeah we'll, we'll help that uh that things uh, transition through um, these things tend to go in waves or cycles, don't they? Um, mm. And we just have to be prepared to to, to ride through it, or work out the best uh, the best outcome. Um, so just to, to move these into the the slightly more personal questions and uh, and, and sort of takeaways um, was do you have a, a particular a, a book or tool or um, thing that you're working with at the moment that that's exciting you or or you'd like to share with the with the listeners? Yeah, actually, there's a bit of an old fashioned book that I've enjoyed fairly recently. Um, I forget the name of the author, um, but it's called The Goal. Uh, it's not in any way relevant to my industry. It's actually more relevant to um, uh, manufacturing in a factory. So it's, it's about running a factory. Uh, it talks about the, um, what is it called? There's like a a uh, law of restrictions that's not true at all that's entirely uh, bottlenecks simple. bottlenecks exactly yeah it talks about one bottlenecks. Of my, one of my favorite books even even overall because it, it's not written as a textbook is it it's written as a story so it's, yeah. it's a different way of learning too yeah i mean it, it is it's a story about a guy that runs a factory and his problems getting through that and and his problems with his wife and it's all it, i'll I would say I would class it as entirely average as a book to take to a beach on holiday. Um, but it's actually quite a really good way to introduce you uh, to an awful lot of things like uh, inventory control and cash flow uh, and looking at bottlenecks and seeing where your issues are in your business. And I remember when I read that um, only about a year ago, I think I read that book uh, and I just sat down with my two business partners and we pointed at the uh, pile of assembled PCBs that we had sitting in the corner of the office that we had created because we were concerned about uh, supply lines and about microchips and shortages. And since then, we have been referring to that pile as my mountain of shame, um, just because we could have, we didn't have to spend so much time and money getting those assembled when actually all we really needed to do was stockpile some of the chips that were on them. We could have then used that cash to um, get staff in to innovate differently. So that's uh, that. That's think, a good one. I like that one. 
yeah, we can all learn more about the theory of constraints and uh, theory of and improving our bottleneck sort of thing. Yeah, um, even if we don't have have kilns or things that are, are queuing up and waiting to to fire parts. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I listened to this on some some long journeys, so <laughs> so I did listen to it or at least part of it while on holiday, um, or, or at least going on holiday. Uh, uh, and uh, no, it's it's a good thing. Uh, I think we all, we all need, uh, and the writing is pretty good. We all need one of those sort of um, mentors, but one that slightly frustrates us and and, and challenges us to um, when we've got to have that change of thinking. Because uh, I think with with some of these things, if you're only presented the problem, mm -hmm. you you won't have the same solution as if you think through it. Like if someone gave you the answer, you, you're not going to appreciate what the problem was and and, and why why something is a bottleneck you'll just see well i should move i should move all the things over here or i should put a ticket on it or whatever yeah um, no, you won't you like that you won't reapply that to other things as well to any sort of issue that you have that's very similar or if that issue changes ever so slightly you won't know how to adjust to that if you haven't co completely understood it yeah we, we've been moving uh, uh, some of our systems into um thing that i'd only started learning about before uh, more recently that uh, it connects to some of the stuff of of hypotheses uh, and trying to learn from our um uh to learn from case studies to learn from from problems that they're not problems they're just uh they're things that we need to make a solution we need to innovate on we need to uh work out how to how to um, reduce the risk on whatever and and i think some of that is is it's you need to you need to have that friction you need to feel uncomfortable um if, if the goal doesn't make you feel a little bit uncomfortable you're not going to challenge yourself to solve it, it it's just going to sit on the side and uh, and not get bothered bothered with yeah it. absolutely I, no, that's I'm a cool. big fan of being uncomfortable, a little bit uncomfortable all the time. Yeah, yeah. If you get get too comfortable, you'll you'll miss that, that someone else isn't and someone else rode past you. Yeah. So uh, yeah. No, that's cool. Um, I I really appreciate that and appreciate your time and and just to, it sort of connects back to a little bit what you were saying with the the sort of uh, society and and sort of changes. Uh, was um our, our last uh, question that maybe fits as 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 the best guess that this fits with <laughs> of if we could give you a superpower. Or um, you can put this in the hands of, of one of your your customers if you want, and, and put but give it to them that if they are backed in a corner, if you're backed into a corner and you need to come out on top. Oh, I feel like it should be nothing to do with my business. I feel like it should be something to do with uh, social justice and social change. But in the in the in the part of this uh, podcast series where it is something to do with, oh, you know what? It would be the superpower to get to the heart of someone's issue rather than seeing the symptoms um i think this is a this is something where uh we and i i imagine an awful lot of other people um probably a lot of people that work in it um have messages or support tickets or something or hit f somehow through rumor or hearsay have heard that something isn't functioning in a way that they intended um but haven't had the ability to get to the heart of what the actual problem is you know well, our, our network devices our, our devices sit on the network we have questions all the time where people say it's not connected to the software we go great that's a symptom Let's get to the heart of the problem, right? Is there a cable? Is it plugged in? Does it have power? Is it actually sitting on the same network? Is your computer turned on? Is there a firewall? All of those different things. Uh, I think getting to the heart of the problem immediately would be my uh, my my superpower that I would choose for this. Love that, love that. Um, it was on, on the news the other day that they um, they decided to shelve. Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the the innovation product that was winning some awards of um, cleaning up the or the plastic in the sea. Yeah, um, these sort of special boats that could sort of suck up and filter out the plastic. Um, but the, the the issue was that that is going to be uh, it's a it's a symptom. It's not the problem. I mean, th there's, there will forever be plastic in the sea if we keep throwing it in the sea. Yeah. Um, so uh, th there it was never going to be a viable like you're not making money out of this plastic. No one wants plastic. It's it's totally good to get it out the sea but maybe we should be doing something else too and so it wasn't going to totally solve the problem and i think they they had problems with sort of keeping their funding going because it was a brilliant product and it was needed but <laughs> um it didn't connect up to a sort of a long-term solution and 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 getting rid of that problem in the first place it, it wasn't a it's a man-made yes. problem <laughs> well and also it, it has the risk of contributing more to the problem because right. people now go oh well it's being cleaned up so it's all right mm -hmm. to throw it away that's mm -hmm. fine yeah yeah yeah, it doesn't 
it, it, it makes single use still still there. So um, yeah. No. Uh, well, uh, thank you for for coming on and, and showing us your your products that, that definitely aren't single use. They 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 can be uh, bent and used and worked with in in so many different uh, uh, directions. Absolutely. Uh, so um, yeah. So just to, to wrap up there, um, where where can people uh, best get in contact you with you or um, uh, what sort of companies and things would you like to to chat to? So um, we would like to chat to anyone who's out there making their own uh, immersive shows uh, or interactive or any sort of live experience, uh, whether that's an art project or an escape room or uh, something for your family or for your home or for Halloween or Christmas. Um, come and uh, say hi to us or just have a go at uh, downloading our product. So our, um, you, can, you can try COGS out for free at COGS, that's C-O-G-S dot show. Uh, that's the that's the product website, but you can also just have a look at some of the other shows that we've we've installed it on uh, at our, our website, which is clockwork dot dog. Um, we decided to go with the dog domain on that one because why not? Yeah, if it does what it says on the tin, then uh, that's, <laughs> you might as well keep it keep it tight and simple. Yeah, um, I like that. Um, no, that's great. Well, thanks very much for for coming on, and we'll we'll get on the show, and I'll, I'll see if I can uh, twist your arm afterwards to give us any rec recommendations of uh, of experiences to to go and uh, try out over the the next few months and, uh, and get more of an experience ourselves. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been fun. Cool. That's been great. Thanks very much for talking. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thanks for joining us again on the Cliff Notes podcast. With. We can uh, find out more about this show and the show notes uh, by checking out the website cliffnotespodcast.com or we publish on Twitter, Facebook and other social media channels. So we look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm.